and welcome to our webinar today. Our presenter has a really fun webinar play, uh, planned for us tonight or this evening, but before we start, I just want to kindly remind everyone to mute themselves if they have um, some background noise. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to unmute yourself and share them with the group because we it does look like we have a small group or you can always utilize the chat. I'll be helping our presenter, Alex, monitor that tonight. Um, but I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Alex. I don't know if you want to quickly introduce yourself. Sure. Um, hey, folks. Uh, my name is um, Alex Jones. I um, go by uh, he, him pronouns, and I am employed at UC Santa Cruz as the manager of the Campus Natural Reserve. Um, the Campus Reserve is currently about 400 acres of our 2,000 acre campus, and it's used as an outdoor classroom and living laboratory where students get involved with um, experiential education. Um, through their participation in field research projects, through course field trips, um, stewardship projects that they can work on as well. And my job is just to kind of support that involvement. Um, right now during COVID, things are obviously looking very different. Very few students are living on campus um, and the students that are around in town or on campus are it's pretty, we're pretty restricted with what we can do with them outside. So I've found myself in this virtual classroom um, quite a bit um, during that time period um, by offering remote internships and um, class, remote class visits and that kind of thing. So my time in the forest is, has been cut down a bit in, on the professional level, but um, Nonetheless, um, I am here to talk kind of about how that's been going and to hopefully talk with you all about some strategies for um, involving students in studying out um, the outdoors, um, even within this kind of remote virtual environment. Um, so um, I have some slides to share. Um, if people keep trickling in, great. We we'll, Maybe we'll do some breakout rooms for some activities we're going to do. If, if it's a small group like this, we'll probably just stick together. And, and um, yeah. So um, welcome, everyone. OK. Stop share. Present. OK. Hi, Melissa. Good to see you. <laughs> hey, Alex, you too. Good to see you. Um, you'll notice a little bit of overlap on what I did with your class, but, but not entirely. Um, so um, before I begin, I just want to recognize I, I can't see a lot of you. Um, feel free to turn your camera on. Feel free to leave them off. Up to you. Uh, but I, would, I think most of you are probably teachers. Um, and I just wanted to put out a huge amount of appreciation and respect for the process you've all been having to go through this past year. I don't, I don't know exactly what kind of situation you've been in, but I assume it has involved uh, remote learning and you know, scrambling to transform your curriculum into that format and dealing with all of the ped, um, you know, all of the issues that have surrounded. Um, being a teacher and having students uh, attempt to learn in this environment during COVID. So um, thank you for all the hard work that you've put into this. I know it's, it's been a lot. So um, as I mentioned, my job is to support um, undergraduate involvement in learning outdoors. Um, and I know that um, Calteach, you know, is K through 12 or like, you know, not university level necessarily. So, Everything I talk about today, we're gonna, you know, look at through the lens of how how might this be implemented for different age groups, and how might we, um, you know, adapt a very um, sort of general framework to these different um, different classes. So, field inquiry in the virtual classroom, incorporating the outdoors into your le remote learning environment. We're gonna start with this. I don't know if ow is the right word or maybe ew is the right word. I'm not sure. Apologies if this is turning anybody's stomach or uh, harming your sens sensibilities here. But this is a phenomenon. If you were to be walking around somewhere outside and you were to encounter this, 
Do you think you would notice it? Do you think it would strike you as strange or odd in some kind of way? It seems pretty dramatic to me. It's not something I run across every day. I've never actually seen this. This is not a photograph I took, but it's a photograph um, a friend of mine took when he was visiting the Mojave Desert with uh, a group of undergraduates last year. So if you encountered this rather dramatic phenomenon, you have some choices. You can run away screaming. You could investigate it closer. And if you go that latter path, there's some things you can do, and that involves asking questions. So what we're going to do in this talk is practice this, some fundamentals of inquiry. Things that if you're trying to get your students outside during the pandemic, during virtual learning, how are you going to engage them in the process where you can't be there right next to them, pointing at something, talking them through ideas about what they're seeing? So how how can you basically use a framework to guide them through their own exploration of being outside and exploring? So we'll do a little bit of that today by actually practicing it ourselves. And we'll use some very basic prompts. These were, um, I don't know if been um, created by or just sort of really promoted by an educator named John Muir Laws. Some of you may be familiar with him. He's a naturalist, educator, and artist from the Bay Area who's written a few um, great books that I will link you to later. Um, but these are just very simple prompts, easy to remember, that can guide this process of looking closely in nature and engaging in the cyclical process of inquiry. We'll practice that together. We'll talk about how we might apply this to the virtual classroom, um, whether those are activities you would do during actual virtual meetings um, or independent assignments that you would give students. Um, and then use your virtual meetings to sort of uh, discuss and debrief. And throughout all of this, we'll be using um, field journaling as sort of the, um, the hub for all of this, the place where the learning happens, where it gets documented by students. We'll also get into a little bit of um, equity in the virtual outdoor classroom. Um, and then also um, I'll provide you with some resources to learn more about this as, um, as you try it out. At any time, please just unmute yourself, interrupt. Um, let me know if you have questions or ideas or if you've tried something like this. I, um, I wanna hear about it. We can all learn from each other here. And I do have a space like towards the end where I do wanna ask, like open it up and be like, who's done anything like this? How did it go for you? So we can um, try that out. I'm, I'm also realizing, Jessica, that I'm, I'm like trying, I'm using my phone as a webcam for the first time today. Um, and I realize that that kind of gets rid of my time piece. So I might occasionally check in with you and be like, what time is it? Yeah, for sure, no problem. Oh, I'm going. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to that. Ah, oh, zoomed in even more. So what I'm gonna do is, Copy the link address, cool, that worked. Um, let's see, how many people we have now? We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, let's do breakout rooms, why not? So I'm gonna escape because I can never navigate Zoom when I'm fully presenting there. But um, in the chat, I'm going to paste a link to a Google slide, it's just a single slide. I'm gonna go in there and um, duplicate it so that each breakout room has their own. Wasn't sure how many there would be. So everyone come on over and join that. I've set the, yes, you're able to edit, cool. I was on top of it when I made it, but I forgot. Um, okay, so, Split your screen there between Zoom and that for a second. And you can see there's just some text boxes here. We'll just do slide one, slide two, slide three, slide four. Each of those numbers will correspond to your breakout room. And what I'd like for you to do is to create a list of questions based on that thing that you saw. I'll put the picture on the slides here so you can refer back to it. 
but that head of that animal on the plant. And just try to be as curious as you can and just what would you, if you encounter this, what kinds of questions come up for you? And think about this as if you're a detective trying to solve a mystery. You know, a basic question is, how did that happen? But you might find that there's other questions that are surrounding that, that come up for you. So let's just use this as just a total brainstorm to just generate a bunch of ideas that could guide further observations while you're out in the field. So any questions before we go into breakout? Okay. Uh -huh. Just see how long this is. I'm just going to give you uh, five minutes for this, and then we'll come on back after that. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you a 30-second countdown when they end. All right.
Oh, looks like everybody's back. Okay. Um, well, let's see here. Get you all back so I can see you. Okay, cool. Sometimes I, do, I forget that you're back. All right, so let's see. Um, I'm going to just go over to cool. this for a second um, and finish copying over a couple of these. And let's check it out together. So I gave you a pretty just basic prompt. What kind of questions come up for you when you see this? And there's quite a bit of, of quite, a, quite a few questions that came up during the, the breakout rooms, um, ranging from what kind of plant, what kind of animal, um, to what kind of colors do you see, which is a different a different thing that I would have chosen to focus on, but it shows you the breadth of like how many different um, possibilities there are for observation and investigation um, of anything, really. The thing about doing this process outside of making observations and asking questions is that it, it just tends to be a very rich, but sometimes overwhelming environment to do it in because there's a lot going on and a lot of different possibilities. So. Some of these things I noticed also, there were some other observations that came up. It looks like there's no pollution in this particular spot. So in this process of asking questions about what you're seeing, it's, it's very common for more observations to come out because as you're thinking about what could be happening here, you're, no, you're looking around and naturally seeking to find answers. And in that process, you're gonna be discovering more as you go. So, one thing you can do when you encounter a phenomenon, and someone put this definition here, which was very helpful. Um, phenomenon in a scientific context is something that is observed or um, occurs or exists. Um, what phenomenon is here? Would anyone like to actually, maybe the person who wrote that or somebody else, would someone else like to take a stab at that? What phenomenon is here? We'll back it up to that kind of level of the observation for a second. And if you, if you want to, you can just unmute and go for it. Susan, were you going to say something or Suzanne? No. Okay. All good. Um, was that a yeah or a no? That was a no. Okay. <laughs> a no. Sounds good. Um, so the phenomenon is there's a head on a spike, people. That's, that's the phenomenon that I see. So ask, there's all these different questions. Um, is the plant sharp or spiky? That's a, that would, if you look down here at the bottom, these color-coded sort of types of questions, that is a question that you would be able to immediately answer um, using more observations down here in orange. So you could go and you could tap with your finger and touch it and be like, is it spiky? And you would probably realize, yeah, it is spiky. So that, that question being answered right there can lead you down another path. Okay, well then the next question could be, um, how did the animal get there? Um, there's some, how long was it here? Does this happen frequently? That kind of thing. So how did it get there? It seems to have been slid down the spike somehow, maybe through the eye socket. How did that happen? And that might lead you down the road towards making further observations. So I'll just kind of leave it at that for the moment and move back over here. Um, so we are just engaging in the beginning parts of a process of field inquiry. And this is just an iterative process of observing and thinking. 
So obviously this can be applied to any subject in any kind of context really. Um, but outside, as I mentioned, tends to be a, a really rich place to do it. So Dr. Ken Norris was a professor at UC Santa Cruz and UCLA in the past, and, and he taught a field course that would go to the Mojave Desert where that picture was taken and where the student um, MC is taking some field notes. Um, and he would lead students through this process that he called spinning the wheel. And he called it a wheel because it, it observation leads to question, leads to thinking about possible answers, leads to more observations and more questions, and it just goes on and on like that. So the spinning wheel process starts with observation where you notice. And sometimes it is helpful to have this prompt, I notice, dot, dot, dot. This is something that's very easy for students of all levels to, to understand this basic. I notice, fill in the blank. What are you noticing about this particular phenomenon? Then you ask one or more questions. I wonder is that prompt where you get to, you know, just let your mind go with all the different questions that come up for you. Fill in the blanks, I wonder. Now the inquiry part kind of gets pushed a little further where you actually can propose one or more explanations. This is equivalent to sort of the hypothesis generation kind of phase. Could it be that this is happening? So could it be, I wonder how the head got on the spike. Could it be that some kind of predator put it there? You could seek evidence for or against these explanations through more observation. That one might be kind of tricky to observe. You'd have to sit for a long time and watch a predator actually do something like that. That could be kind of hard to do. Um, but you might ask a different question. How did they get it on there? And then you could look more closely. It seems like they might have gone through the eye socket. How did they get the head off of the animal? Um, and just kind of come up with some ideas, um, propose some explanations. And then using your field journal as a place to record this process, um, and then just cycling through it as necessary, because often you do need to go back and make more observations, which will lead to more questions. So real quickly, we'll look at another phenomenon here. I was lucky enough to go up to the snow a couple weeks ago, and I noticed that around the base of all the trees, for the most part, most of the trees, was a divot, like a lower area compared to the snow all around. But I noticed that they were not always the same. You can see this one's really broad over here. This one is, you know, not as broad or this one. This was a younger tree and it was all around here. It was a very small one here. And here's a tree with kind of a big bowl underneath like that. So in that kind of a situation, an ob that's the observation. I noticed these big bowls or these divots or varying sizes around the base of these trees where the snow is lower. What's going on with that? How did those form was my question. So this is another chance um, for us to kind of brainstorm. We won't go into breakout rooms this time. I will do it, um, paste this into the chat here you wouldn't mind opening this one up again. Um, this one is a place where you'll see two columns. There's one, um, let me just get out of here for a second. Um, possible explanations and then evidence, what might you seek? So if our question is, how did the, um, how did those form? we would come up with an explanation and then something we might um, go to look for. So I'll give one example. Um, if you want to open up that she actually don't worry about actually never mind. We'll just do it by the chat. Um, so how did this form? One explanation I had was the the foliage in the crown of the tree catches the snow and that snow doesn't fall directly down below the tree. And then when the snow melts, it drips down in that water dripping down from the crown, melts the snow further right below it. So it creates this kind of low area. So if that's my explanation, 
trapping of the snow by the, the leaves and then melting and then dripping and um, kind of melting the snow down below afterwards, evidence I could look for could be, um, you know, looking at the width of the crown and then looking to see if that corresponds with the width of the divot that I see below the tree. And then that leads me back to the observation where I go to look and lo and behold, that did not appear to be totally what was going on because some trees had a pretty big crown, but they only had a small little divot around the side. So if anyone else has any ideas of what could be going on, let's just stick with the proposed explanations part. Um, we'll do a little chat storm thing. So don't press return on the chat, but type something into the chat. I'll give you like a minute or something to think of something and type it in the chat. And then I'll count to three and we can all press return at the same time and see what comes up. Hopefully someone will do something. <laughs> so there'll be at least one thing in the chat. Any possible explanations of what could be going on? Okay, someone's already put one in there. So if everyone else, if you have an idea, just go ahead and press return on your chat um, and we'll get them all in there. Water dripping from the leaves. Yeah, I had that thought too. If like this, you know, they're gonna hit, get more sunlight potentially being up up high and maybe the that snow will melt first and drip down. Tree generating heat around its stem. I thought of that too. And I was wondering how, is that, does that happen? It's something to do with the tree's roots. Oh, interesting. So let's go with tree generating heat around its stem. If that's our proposed explanation, what evidence would we seek? What could we go do to kind of investigate that outside? You can type your answer into the chat. You can say it out loud. Can you give me a, a thumbs up virtual or if your camera's on, your camera's on like a real thumb. Are you all teachers? Thermometer, for sure. <laughs> Basic measurement of heat. Yeah, so stick a thermometer, I don't know what. Do you mean like on the outside of the tree, on the inside of the tree, against the base of it where the snow is? Ooh. Yeah, I was thinking of measuring the trunk and then the air, like around the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Like, I wonder. Yeah. Like, we... Maybe there's like a gradient of, you know, a temperature gradient, like as you get further from the trunk. Oh. Yeah, because that's interesting, right? Because these, the observed kind of diameter of these like low depression areas varied, right? So does that relate to the diameter of the tree? Or is there something else? And does a larger diameter tree create more heat? So with that, just example, you can see how you could come up with one explanation and then track it down. And one of the keys is to try to come up with more than one explanation so that you don't get too attached to your first idea. So, okay, cool. Let's move on here. So you can see how th this is a process, question, uh, observation, question, proposing explanation, seeking out evidence for those things, wash, rinse, repeat. So if you're trying to do this with your students, what are your opportunities to do this in a virtual classroom setting? So in the moment with the instructor is sort of what I've been trying to do with you. Um, students writing observations and questions in a communal space like Google Slides or some other format, Padlet, whatever. And this could be while observing a photo like we're doing or during or after watching a video that you post, or you as the instructor holding up a particular object that you can manipulate, show different sides of or whatnot. If you happen to have a document camera that you use, you know, you can have it on your tabletop and manipulate it like that. So, that's one option and then you can move to discussion with that. Um, or you can provide a more specific field journaling prompt that they can complete in a group or breakout room setting. 
So that could be, again, following up on an object that you present or some other way for them to engage with a particular phenomenon. So also within a meeting, there's another option, which is getting prepped by you giving them some um, you know, background information, some strategies for them to use, and then actually trusting them to leave. And then here's the trick is like trusting them to come back during your session. So you might be like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Here's our prompts, 20 minutes, or you go out and do this, and then you come back and bring back your, your field journal and your ideas, and we'll discuss this in a breakout room and then um, all together. So we'll talk a minute in a minute about equity and how it's like, you know, not everybody can walk outside into the Mojave Desert and, you know, and see something like that. So how does this play out when students have different types of environments that they're working with. Um, and then another option is giving them a field inquiry assignment outside of class time as homework, and then them bringing it back in and using class as a time for discussion, feedback, and peer review. So the field journal is your, um, you know, this is the hub where all of this takes place. And the field journal is an excellent place to combine writing, drawing, and quantification and to capture this process. Um, can I get a time check, Jessica? Yeah, it's uh, 4.35. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so one thing that um, I did uh, in the fall was um, created an online version of a program that we did out in the field the prior year where we took um, over 600 first year students from UC Santa Cruz outside to engage in this process of field inquiry. This fall, we transformed it into an online setting and we had three different Zoom meetings where we led them through different aspects of this process and had exercises that they participated in through watching videos, commenting on, you know, I notice, I wonder about those, breakout rooms where they discussed things. And then in between their meetings, they had some, um, homework assignments where they went out and did this process on their own home turf. So here's an example of how we set this up. Um, there was an infographic sort of directions and then there was just the text directions. Um, they say the same thing, just different formats. And then we actually created a template for the students to use. So it wasn't just an intimidating blank page in their field journal. This is the first page of the template and I'll actually just kind of breeze you through um, over here, show you a little bit more. So the first page of the template goes over some really important information that all field journals um, should have, which is the metadata or the context for the observation. It places whatever you're discussing and noticing in time and space. And that allows you to follow it up, follow up on it in the future, but actually creates a historical document that could be referred to in the future to be like this particular phenomenon was seen in this place in this time. So that includes location, weather conditions, and it helps to describe where you are to have a little more context. So in this one, this was based on I notice and I wonder, and we gave them space to just get out there and start big with brainstorming. What is a descriptive list of at least 10 phenomenon you can observe? I notice. So they had space here to list out at least 10 different things. Then they had a space to take detailed notes on one of these particular things. Um, so a little further directions was including some detailed text, uh, at typo here, including a sketch with labels um, and just ways to think about including writing, drawing, and quantification in that closer observation. And that just might be mean measuring something, looking at it very closely to look at fine details. So then there was a space to write down 10 questions sparked by your observation of that one particular thing. Sometimes these numbers, you know, that's gonna be more helpful for um, younger students, I would imagine you're all more on top of all that kind of stuff than I am, I'm sure. Um, and then a space to kind of reflect on this exploration time. What is the most interesting thing or intriguing thing you observed out of your list of 10 or something that surprised you? 
What questions or, um, do you feel most curious about? How did it feel to be out there and explore? The second um, assignment followed up on that and was the, the inquiry part where you take your question and propose explanations and look for evidence. So same metadata at the beginning, again, to capture everything in time and space. And then we asked them to return to one of the phenomena they observed in question during assignment one and write down a question that says a why question related to an observation, um, that particular observation. Here's a space where you get to propose three explanations and possible evidence or experimentation you would look for related to those explanations additional ideas, and then a space for them to actually go out and, and seek some of that evidence um, for these different explanations. So they'll have this period of thinking about what they observed, coming up with ideas, and then actually going back for further observations um, and seeing what they came up with. So a, a, some blank space for that, and then another opportunity to kind of reflect on this process. Um, so this was just one, one way of presenting this kind of thing with a little bit more of an organized, um, organized prompts behind it. This was pretty effective for, for the undergraduate level, but I also did have um, a friend who teaches seventh and eighth grade use this as well. And he found that this worked pretty well with his students um, too. There were some videos that we made that went along with this process. There are four videos, one for I Notice, one for I Wonder, um, and then the last two dealing with the inquiry process and then also field journaling. So I'd be happy to make those videos available to you all as well um, if they seem like they might be useful. I see a question in the chat. Um, yes, for sure. Um, and now is the time where I wanna highlight a little bit more of um, John Muir Laws. I'll come back to him also when we get to the resources section, but he has a couple um, incredible books about field journaling and um, essentially providing curriculum for um, doing this out in the field with various age groups. There, he has free PDF versions of these books as well online, which I highly recommend downloading. Um, so there, these are a few diff different ways that he demonstrates um, how you can use field journaling as a way to explore. So over here is a sound map where students are practicing um, representing sound through symbology, through words, placing themselves in space and those sounds in space around them. Over here is an example of a comic strip where describing an event or you know, a scene over here is actually uh, just walking along a particular trail and then finding things that stuck out as noticeable and interesting along the trail and sketching and making la labeled sketches and notes. Over here is watching a ground squirrel and looking at what behavior is it doing and watching it long enough to be like, it's doing these five things pretty much. It's calling sometimes, it's standing up, it has this lower posture, looks like it's eating while well, hunched over and then running away and then watching for a period of time to see how often is it doing these things? Recording every say 10 seconds, what is it doing? And then making a graph of that. So a really cool way to quantify your observations. Here's a map, both aerial and cross-sectional views, practicing using symbology, getting a sense of scale. And then this one can be really useful, which is comparisons where you take two, this is two plants, um, two woody plants, elderberry and a buckeye, and just having them right next to each other as a way to um, use that comparing and contrasting process to allow you to see details that you might have overlooked otherwise. Uh, there they are bigger. Um, I also created quite a few uh, field journaling prompts as part of an internship that I've been leading this quarter, which is just called natural history practice. There's no point to it other than to just get out there and practice this kind of stuff outside using your field journal. So it's about 10 weeks of different prompts that focus sometimes on specific taxa like birds, but sometimes more just overall, um, you know, habitat descriptions, listing of questions, um, 
engaging in the inquiry process and that kind of thing. So again, that's something else I'd be happy to share as well. So these are good for you know homework assignments, or you can distill them down into shorter, more discrete assignments to do during one of those like come back after 20 minute things in the middle of your meeting. So um, can I get another time check, Jessica? Yeah, it's 4.43 and someone asked if they could get the, the name again. Um, John Muir Laws, L-A-W-S. I'll come back to him in another couple slides. So I understand that there's going to be some um, in-person learning happening uh, relatively soon if you're not already doing it. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about like going outside, right, and finding these cool phenomenon, but like what if you just have a sidewalk to look at? What if you have, um, you know, one particular tree? Or what if this is your schoolyard right here? So if you wanted to do this and actually take your students outside, because, hey, COVID is actually a good time to be outside with people, right? If the weather is good enough, a little bit safer potentially than indoors. So using your, your campus of your school to engage in this process. So I found this picture online of a schoolyard in Washington, D.C. and if you would be willing to unmute yourself now or just type into the chat, what are some phenomenon that could be available to explore in this setting? See if I can make the chat come up for myself. Oh, there we go. So any particular things that jump out to you? You might, you might take students outside to try to do this process and be like, I don't know, I don't see anything. What's going on here? So modeling curiosity and noticing things yourself goes a long way towards engaging other people too. Well, I'll just start off with one thing that you probably noticed too, is um, I noticed that there's vegetation growing along the fence line and within the cracks over here. For a high schooler, that might be like, duh, but for a second grader or something like that, it might be like, Huh. Absorption of energy on different surfaces. Cool. So you've heard of like the urban heat island effect, maybe, where like asphalt, you know, absorbs and then radiates heat. Maybe there's something going on. There's different colored like concrete over here compared to the asphalt over here. Interesting. Maybe one's reflecting light versus absorb, reflecting light and heat versus absorbing light and heat. There's something going on with the way water is being trapped by these structures or cracks or something. Anyone notice anything different? The more we're able to kind of tune into this process and start looking at the world as if it's just unknown and a mystery, everything is sort of just a mystery that is possible to track down um, clues for. It can really kind of open your eyes to all sorts of different things that normally we just kind of walk by. So I don't know what these white marks are here, if that's chalk, if that's bird poop or something, but examining like, you know, what's the distribution of these markings on the pavement? Does that have anything to do with, you know, non-human animals or with kids playing here? Is it, could you track the behavior of, of the students on the playground based on the markings left behind? So I just encourage you to Take some time when you get back to your campus if you're going to have uh, um, in-person students and just take a little walk around and be like, what is available to me and to the students as potential questions um, that they could investigate? So having a little short list in your mind before you take students out there and just turn them loose can be really helpful. Because um, like I said, it can be overwhelming for people to just step out and be like, there's so many possibilities. Wow, look at that, look at that, look at that. I don't know what's going on. Let's check your, my phone. So good idea to have a few things in your back pocket as potential things to explore. So moving on near the end now, like why, why do this? And what are some of the practices and the benefits? So it's a pretty explicit launch pad into the scientific method, but it, you can also think of it as, you know, an opportunity for collaboration through small group work, brainstorming, exploring together, creativity through the ideas they come up with and the ways they think of to investigate that. And then also awareness that I was just sort of talking about before of just opening your senses 
to the phenomenon and mysteries that are, are surrounding? And then how can you leverage that in a classroom later? Through field journaling, you have this combination of writing, drawing, and quantification. Physically, if you're doing this together, or even for the students, you know, we were in front of computers a lot these days. It's a mix of sitting, of sitting and moving in both fine and gross motor skills. Opportunity to promote and practice a growth mindset. And this is huge with field journaling. The examples of John Muir Laws, he is an excellent artist. And when you look at his stuff, sometimes it is just like, oh, yeah, cool, man. Awesome. No way I can make it look like that. So just using this process as an opportunity to go over growth mindset with your students to try to encourage them that, that this is just a practice. There's no good drawing. There's only the next drawing. Here are some strategies we can use to get us to the next level of our understanding. Let's do this together. Um, and see where we are next week. And then we'll check in again and see where we are the week after that. So I'm curious, is anybody doing anything like this already with your classes, be they virtual or in person right now? Okay. I'm working on my wait time. It's awkward on Zoom, especially with no when no one has their uh, there's not very many cameras on. <laughs> I can't see if the gears are turning or what. So we can come back to that. If anyone has any ideas, just pipe in. Um, okay. So one aspect of the e equity issue um, is actually the next slide. But um, so there's all sorts of equity issues that have come up during the pandemic. All sorts of problems with our systems that have shown that the most vulnerable and marginalized populations are just how, how they're being left behind. It's become more, more um, upfront and obvious. Um, I assume at this point, a year into it, your school district has addressed some primary virtual learning equity issues like Wi-Fi, computer, and other devices. I know some of those are hard to address. So I'm not sure how that's been playing out. Um, so there's that aspect to this, obviously, just like with any other virtual classroom stuff. Um, but then I also wanted to point you towards this website that um, UCSD, um, sorry, I could copy into the chat um, like this. Um, UCSD has developed for um, teachers doing virtual education. And I, it's geared towards the university, but I think it would be useful for anybody probably. Um, and this is a really good list of best, best practices for equity in a remote classroom. So I just want to share that if you haven't already seen a bunch of stuff like that. So in the virtual outdoor classroom, what's this thing at the bottom here is actually probably the most important thing. And it is um, not creating a hierarchy between different types of study sites. So not saying something like, you know, you know, go outside and explore this like natural habitat. But if you only have you know, this kind of a yard, or if you only have a sidewalk, you know, avoiding just using language that, that kind of puts those um, more, say, urban settings. Um, or if you're only, if you're in an apartment and you can't get outside, then maybe you could blah, blah, blah. Like, you can, you can address those issues, but try not to make it sound like those are less than. Um, so options are just like outside your place of residence, if you happen to have some kind of a yard, um, or a sidewalk, um, or a nearby park or other open space that works better for like homework, not so much the come back after 20 minutes sort of thing. And then there's possibilities to do this inside too, the same process. You know, this is supposed to be the virtual outdoor classroom, but you can get at these same concepts and just practice this process inside. And then later, if you were to take it outside, you know the process and you can just do it with the richness of the natural world. So here it could be, you know, looking out, of an open or closed window. Open could provide you with some auditory clues. Um, looking into a closet or a junk drawer could be really fun. And there's all sorts of observations to be made and questions that could come up with that. And that's a really good place to study if you're doing an exercise on like species diversity, for example, you know, the different numbers of different things, um, you know, and just different rooms that are available indoors. 
So moving now on to some resources that are available to you, I highly encourage you to visit John Muir Laws' website. Um, and it's just johnmuirlaws.com. These are the two um, books that he's created that have field journaling curriculum. They're both free as PDFs. It just shows his dedication towards supporting educators. Um, they're amazing books. They're, they can be a little overwhelming and intimidating at first, but just pick off little chunks at a time and work on those. And then his website is full of resources, free online lessons. He has so many different videos he's posted. And some of them are like how to draw like a great horned owl. And some of them are how to, you know, propose explanations and seek evidence. And, and a list goes on and on. There's educator resources here, um, which include these kinds of things. Um, and then if you go to his blog, I'm just going to quickly scroll through and just show you the depth of his productivity. So instructional videos, just watch this scroll down. And like, I know we don't want how many videos can we really watch? And then can you show your students? But for your own learning, if you're curious about this, how to draw birds, how to draw mammals, how to draw reptiles, amphibians, and fish and insects, draw plants and flowers, landscapes, watercolor, nature journaling, nature education, natural history, blah, blah, blah. It just goes on and on and on and on. Um, it, it's incredible. I have not even scratched the surface, um, but I'm excited to kind of delve a little more deeply into that. Another group that he has worked with as well, that's out of the Bay Area, um, is called the Beatles Project. And they primarily support outdoor educators, but there's also um, in, whoops, indoor science lessons that they um, have as well. Some of this is curriculum, some of it is just educator support and trainings, and then actually how to train other educators as well on this. And lastly, if you want to see um, who is responsible for that squirrel head, this is not a squirrel head, this is also a little bit graphic, so look away if you don't want to see the inside of a particular animal. Um, but let me actually stop share, optimize for um, video, which I didn't even know you could do until recently. My turn. This is a bird called the loggerhead spike. You can see the very tip of its bill, it sort of has a bill. It's good for tearing, sort of like if you picture a hawk or a raptor, they have a similar shaped bill. This is a smaller bird, like the size, smaller than a chicken. You can see it has a lizard here that's on a little thorn on the shrub. One of the other common names for loggerhead shrike is it's a butcher bird. It's a sort of a colloquial name. And they, they do, they will cache food, they'll hunt and then cache the food for later. And here's a really good example of watching something and then a whole new set of questions coming up. What are those things? Are they eggs? Why are they pink? How are they so big? And how do they fit inside of a tiny lizard? How long do they stay in the lizard for? Does a lizard hatch live young or did they lay eggs? Um, the questions could go on and on, but this bird will cache its hunt its food and then stick it on these little sharp things, a barbed wire fence, a thorn, a yucca spike like in the beginning, and then come back for it later. And um, I have to look this up, I forget, to see if that's also something that's used for attracting a mate too, is like, hey, look at how productive I can be. Look at all of the prey that I've captured. So anyway, that's, that's my talk. Um, on how to try to engage students in this. It's essentially a process of curiosity. So how to engage students in curiosity outdoors. Any questions? Someone asked in the chat what the name, what is the name of the bird? Um, loggerhead shrike. There's another bird, I'll type it in there. Um, they're not very common around where I live in the central coast. I did see one earlier this winter, but it's not very common here. Um, there's another similar species called the Northern Shrike. It's in more Northern latitudes. I don't have Twitter. Um, 
we just started an Instagram for UCSC Campus Reserve. This is the handle is just UCS Campus Reserve. It's mostly just, you know, plant and animal photos. Oops, I'm only responding to one person. Sorry about that. Um, here's those birds again. And then our website is is on here to UCSC Campus Reserve UCSC.edu. And this is just you know, what well, university program stuff, but also has some natural history information that's um, germane to the Central Coast, California. Uh, cool. I didn't leave very many time, much time for questions, but I'm not seeing too many come in. If there are any in the last minute, I'm happy to address them. All right, well, remember that this is a process you can do too, and all it takes is um, engaging your senses and noticing the world around you. Um, I tend to really access the world through sound. I play music and I've put a lot of attention into just bird song over the years. And that's a good way to actually see birds and learn new birds is hear them first and follow the sound and try to, try to get a, a look at them. Um, but if you develop that, you know, bringing the natural world in through your ears, you can take the natural world with you or be a part of it anywhere you are without even explicitly like, I'm going hiking or I'm studying nature. You're just walking through the world, getting information and input through your ears. So engage your senses um, and- Alex, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, the templates that you shared, will those be in the email that we received with the like response or how do we access the template that you shared for the organizing? That's, yeah, Jessica, is there a follow-up where I could give like the video links and the templates? Like, can I provide that to you or what's the best way to do yeah. it? Yeah, if you want to send me all the links and even the Instagram handle to an email and I'll email everyone who attended and even those who didn't because we are recording this session and we record all our sessions and I put the link um, on the on the chat, but in case um, anyone did, doesn't catch it, if you want to share it out with other people, then we can go ahead and do that. So Alex, either today or tomorrow, when you get a chance, just send it over to me. Perfect. Yeah, thank, thank you. Both. Thanks for the reminder, thank Jennifer. This was great. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for taking the time, everybody. I know you're really busy. It's the end of the day. So um, much appreciated. Very conference week for many of us. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, you get to hang out and just chill then. Nice. No, no, we have to meet with parents and discuss oh. grades. And But this was Obviously. definitely well worth the time. So thank you so much and everyone be well. Yeah, you're welcome. Take care. All right. Well, if no one has anything else, I am happy to say see you later. Thank you, Alex. Bye. All thank right, you. take care. I'll email you, Jessica, with that info. Sounds good. Bye. Bye.